Good evening and welcome to the 31st Orkney International Science Festival online. Tonight it is my pleasure to introduce a talk entitled Curbing the Ice Melt by Mining the Sky, given by Peter Wadhams, Emeritus Professor of Ocean Physics at the University of Cambridge. Our guest this evening is head of the Polar Ocean Physics Group in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at Cambridge. His research on Arctic ice processes and climate change has taken him on 40 polar field expeditions, more than any living scientist. Professor Wadhams is a longtime contributor to the Science Festival and has been a regular and welcome participant since 1993. Today, he will be speaking on the subject of the removal of carbon dioxide and methane from the atmosphere. This is the focus of work he is involved in at the Centre for Climate Repair in Cambridge. Through his research and first-hand experience of climate change in the Arctic, Professor Wadhams has become convinced of the need to advocate for climate engineering to mitigate its harmful effects. While international agreements are to be welcomed, he says, the time has come to switch to a new approach. By developing new technologies to extract atmospheric CO2, individual countries can take positive action in the here and now. And should you have any questions for Professor Wadhams during the event, please enter them into the YouTube live chat and he will answer them at the end of the presentation. So without further delay, here he is, Professor Peter Wadhams. Well, um, good evening, and it's very nice to be here again. Uh, I won't say in Orkney, but uh, in touch with Orkney. Um, okay, and um, what I need to talk about is uh, the problem of how do we manage as a, as a planet uh, to restrict the the warming of the of the the entire planet due to um, use of fossil fuels. Can we do that? Can we not only just restrict the rate of rise of temperature, but actually bring the climate back to the way it was ideally before the Industrial Revolution? Now, the official way that uh, we do that, we, that we try to save the climate, is to emit less carbon dioxide. And that's the official policy of organizations like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The trouble is that uh, carbon dioxide stays in the uh, uh, climate system forever, or for thousands of years anyway. So if we, if we emit carbon dioxide by burning fossil fuels, then um, it, it doesn't just gradually dissipate, it stays around. We're constantly adding to the load of carbon dioxide as we emit it, even if we're reducing our rate of emissions, as the, as the Intergovernmental Panel says we should do, we're still, as long as we add any carbon dioxide, we're making the climate hotter. And the climate, as we can see, is already too hot. So the alternative is to actually get rid of the substance that's producing the greenhouse effect, which is mainly carbon dioxide. So I'm going to argue for getting rid of carbon dioxide by technical means that are pretty well known, but just cost a lot of money. And that can be what, what will save us. That's my, it's a very simple idea, but uh, so far it hasn't got the momentum it needs to, to actually be applied worldwide. Okay, a first slide please. Um, uh, now, what, my argument is contained in this book, which, of course, like all lectures, I advocate as it be read. <laughs> it's called A Farewell to Ice, produced by, uh, published by Penguin Books. Uh, next slide. And at the same time, uh, a, a very nice film has come out called Ice on Fire, um, produced by Leonardo DiCaprio. And he went really all over the world looking at climate change phenomena and the methods that can be used to 
uh, reduce the impact of climate change by looking at um, every method that has been tried. And it's a very nice film. Um, I should add that I'm in this one as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the inspiration, of course, for the, the big effort that's needed now is coming from the younger generation. And of course, the, the star of that is Greta Thunberg. Next slide. Now, people have been aware that the climate is changing and warming, but they weren't aware that that, that change is accelerating and in so many different ways. Uh, we are aware of it now because of the simultaneous floods, fires and, and other disasters which are hitting us due to climate change. Um, so if we look at some of these phenomena, we find global warming has accelerated. And this is warming where we combine the carbon dioxide and methane as major sources. And we find an acceleration going on. Um, the amount of CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere has continued to accelerate. Whatever agreements have been made, including the Paris Climate Agreement, it's had no, no effect at all on the accelerating rate of carbon dioxide addition to the atmosphere, which is the origin of the greenhouse effect. In the same way, methane is accelerating as well. And if we look at temperatures over the, the world, the, the rate at which temperature is rising is unprecedented. And in fact, it's so rapid in the Arctic, they haven't even put it on the map because they didn't have a color for it. Next slide, please. Now, the, the, the key to this, which, which uh, is what doesn't let politicians off the hook, is the carbon dioxide record from a, a station on the top of Mauna Loa, a volcano in Hawaii, which has been kept since 1958 by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And um, we can see that uh, the, the black, which is the trend, that the red is the seasonal variation, has continued to increase exponentially. And it doesn't matter what kind of agreements have been made. So long as man is still putting CO2 into the atmosphere, then the greenhouse effect will continue to accelerate. Next slide. And we can see why this is happening because we obstinately refuse to really do away with uh, fossil fuels. This, this shows the present distribution of global energy sources. And we can see that the three big ones are the same three big ones as a, we've had for, for decades. That is oil, burning oil, burning coal, and burning gas. The, the little ones on the right represent all of what we think of as our hopes for saving the world. That is hydropower, nuclear power, and the very tiny brown one on the far right is renewable energy. That's um, things like uh, uh, solar energy, wind energy, wave energy. From what people say, one would think this is about to take over the world. But if you look at the relative importance of them, the, the renewable energy is still right down there at the bottom. Next slide. And if we look at who are the villains here, who's, who's putting most of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, China is the biggest villain because China's economy is growing very fast and they don't particularly care uh, what source of energy they're using. Um, so they, they've shot up. The USA has flattened off. Europe has decreased somewhat. India's increasing as well. So India and China are the villains here, but we're not... Uh, we're not free of uh, taint because the US and the Europe has only managed to flatten off their emissions because they got China to do all the dirty uh, work for them with, with pollution-laden factories. And we, you notice this, this 
uh, graph mentions cement emissions. And this is something, again, not usually recognized that, that cement is a uniquely awful substance as far as climate change is concerned, because not only does making cement involve the emission of a lot of, involve the use of a lot of energy so that that puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but there's also a chemical reaction going on when, when cement is produced. So cement production is by far the most um, kind of uh, fossil fuel guzzling uh, process that there is. And it's very sad that China seems to be intent on building everything out of, re out of concrete. Uh, every, every office block and every apartment block is built out of concrete because various members of the Chinese Communist Party have, have monopolies of, on the cement industry. So that's a very sad way of making the world worse. Next slide. And this is the net result. Global CO2 emissions are continuing to rise, whatever the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says should be happening. Next slide. Now, for the first, when we started doing this, we mean the human race, when we started um, you emitting, fossil, emitting carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning, we had no idea that uh, this would cause a change in climate. And it wasn't until 1896 that the mechanism for this was worked out properly by a Swedish environmental scientist, Svant Arrhenius. And this was his classic paper about how the greenhouse effect works on the influence of carbon, carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature of the ground. And it, you might be interested to know that uh, he was the great uncle of uh, Greta Thunberg. So these things do run in families. Uh, next slide. Now he calculated how much um, carbon dioxide is pro being produced. Where does it go? He re correctly recognized a lot of it is absorbed by the ocean. And he thought that meant that this was relatively harmless that the carbon dioxide involved in the, in the ocean would not do a lot of harm. So he was wrong about the harmfulness of CO2, but he was correct about the, the origin and the, and the reason why that's increasing. We now, we can, now if we combine carbon dioxide and methane, we have an equivalent uh, total of about 508 parts per million. That's about 420 from uh, carbon dioxide alone. But we see that when we look at them together, given that methane is, is increasing and carbon dioxide, we see that the overall increase in greenhouse gases is really shooting up. There's an inflection point there. It's not, it's, it's, it's rising much faster than it did before 1950. Uh, next slide. And another frightening statistic is to look at how much carbon dioxide there has been in the atmosphere over the last several ice ages. Uh, we can tell from uh, drilling ice cores through, through ice sheets uh, how much carbon dioxide there was in past atmospheres because we can measure the, the composition of, of the carbon dioxide in tiny air bubbles. Uh, in the, and we can see that as Ice Age gives way to interglacial and gives way to another Ice Age, we see a fluctuation between about 180 and about 280 parts per million. And we can think of those as the natural limits that the world would like to adopt uh, if we weren't messing about with it. Um, the lower limit is for an ice age when, when uh, plant production is decreased and the upper limit is for an interglacial like we're in now. Now, um, that looks good until you get to the right hand side, which is when the whole curve took off um, because of our massive greenhouse gas emissions. So if you look at the curve as a whole, you can see that something 
serious has happened to the planet. We've been putting far too much um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and we've produced a, essentially a tipping point and no, no return state that the atmosphere has moved into and that if we want to survive we've got to get it out of that state and of course the simplest way is to get rid of all that added carbon dioxide um, which is my hypothesis here. Uh, next slide. The result of that is, of course, uh, that the warming rate of the planet has increased and is, is continuing to accelerate. Uh, so we're already, again, people talk about, can we keep global warming to less than one and a half degrees? Um, well, it's already more than that one and a half degrees. It's 1.55 if you compare it with pre-industrial levels. Of, of temperature. So we'll, we've already failed to, to keep global warming to less than one and a half degrees. Next slide, please. Now let's think, look at some of the other interesting climate related sources. One of them is food. And again, this is something that people didn't really think a lot about, except vegans, they thought about it. But um, about more than a quarter of global emissions come from actually from food, the production of food. And most of that comes from animal products. And this is because animals um, require space on the Earth's surface to, to, be, uh, to, to grow. They also, many of them actually emit greenhouse gases um, like beef and uh, cows and, and pigs uh, have digestive processes which are rather nasty and involve emitting a lot of uh, greenhouse gas. And so when you combine their personal disgusting emissions with the fact that they are uh, using up large areas of, of the world, then we, we find that they are particularly villainous as far as uh, the future of the planet is concerned. So the pressures that are being put on for going, going for plant-based food, I think have a lot of validity. If we could, if we could bring ourselves to, to, to eat more plant-based food, we will be using less of the Earth's area for uh, growing, for, 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 for growing animals to be eaten and um, it would be of great benefit. Next slide. And this is a, it's claimed to be to scale. How, the, the, how much of the world is actually composed in terms of biomass of a livestock, animals being bred to be eaten. That's the, the cow represents 60% of the biomass of the earth which is actually domestic animals. 36% of the biomass of the world are human beings. And if you look in the corner, only 4% are wild animals. So everybody loves watching, um, uh, everybody loves, loves watching wild, wildlife programs on television, David Attenborough, etc. But these wonderful wide ranging set of species that he discusses actually make up a very, very tiny part of the, the total biomass of the earth. There's not many wild animals left. So this is a pretty worrying thing. And our dependence on, on domestic animals to eat is, is becoming huge. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in addition, we're increasing our, our desire for dairy products, for milk and cheese, and uh, that's rising. And it's, it's rising most rapidly in third world countries that have recently become more affluent, like China, where um, people, when they get a bit more money, would like to eat meat. They would like to eat cheese and butter. And the result is 
the, the consumption of those, those types of product goes up and the amount of carbon dioxide emitted goes up. Next slide. Now, when, when we look at the Arctic, we find it's rising um, in temperature much faster than the rest of the world. In fact, about three times as fast. If we look at the right hand side here, the region north of 60 degrees is growing uh, in, in temperature much faster than the rest of the world. Now, the, the characteristic of the Arctic that we that we think about most is ice. And of course, if you're warming the Arctic, you're melting ice. So the melting of, of both of sea ice and of land ice is a, is, a, is a result of this Arctic amplification. Next slide. And it works both ways, which is hopeful for us, because if you look at um, the red line here, this is an episode when um, in the 1940s and 50s, when the temperature of the world got slightly lower for some reason, um, mainly we were emitting a lot of soot. And we can see that uh, the slight decrease that happened for the world as a whole, that's the red line, was amplified by in the Arctic. And we had the blue line. So the lesson is that the Arctic warms up faster than the rest of the world, but it also cools down faster than the rest of the world. So if we can find a way to cool the Arctic, um, we're doing something, we're doing well. Uh, next slide. Uh, at the moment, it's just right warming and we can see how um, much Siberia in particular warms faster than anywhere else. The red, the red line is, is the Siberian air temperature. Next slide. And um, uh, University of Berkeley did an analysis of land surface heating over the entire world and found that um, in 2020, on average, the world's air temperatures went up or, or land surface temperatures went up by 1.88 degrees, but Siberia went up by five degrees, a massive increase on, on the rest of the world. So Siberia, the Arctic leads the rest of the world in warming and Siberia leads the Arctic. Um, in the words of, of Johnson, it's a world beater. Um, next slide, please. Now, the impact of that is a complete change in the appearance of the Arctic. This is how the Arctic looked when I started out in research in the early 70s thick ice, multi-year ice, with rugged and very difficult to walk over. Next slide. And um, when, when the ice was thin, and this is in Northwest Greenland, at least there was ice there. This is in the middle of winter, and this is the Eskimo town of Karnak. Um, but I went, was the, I went there in 2008, and here it, um, I, I went uh, working with a, a couple of polar bear hunters who had dog teams. And um, so there's, we've got good solid ice to, 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 to go around on, um, an iceberg sitting in the fjord. Then just two years ago, next slide, this is exactly the same scene, uh, the folk done in the same place, with the same dogs, in fact, by a colleague of mine, uh, a Danish colleague. So he went to exactly the same spot. The only thing different is the iceberg gone. But if you look at the dogs, they're not as happy as they were running over nice thick ice. They're sloshing through slushy water, which is very, very dangerous. They could easily go through here. That's the difference in winter. This is the same time of year, March. The winter conditions between 2008 and 2019. Uh, next slide. Then we know, of course, that sea ice is retreating. And um, we can see this is the 2020 limit in September. 
compared to the limit in earlier years. That's the, the little brown line is earlier years. The white is the most recent year measured. You can see a lot of areas being lost and um, we now have open water around the whole of the Siberian Arctic. Next slide. But it's not going in the way that most people, including myself, thought it would go, which is that because September is the month of minimum ice, you would expect that the first ice-free month uh, in the world would be September of some year shortly to, to be occurring. But instead, what's, what the ice is doing now is it's, it's retreating through every season of the year. It's not particularly going for September, but it's going for every month of the year. So the red line is, is the ice extent through 2020. Uh, and then next slide. And then that brings us to 2021. And the blue line is now the ice extent in 2021. So through the whole of last year and the whole of this year so far, the ice has been at a, a minute, had a minimum record minimum extent um, in all seasons of the year, not just in September. Next slide. Now, um, that's going to have some other effects. And this is uh, what I saw in uh, August of 2019. And it's, I should say, it's also exactly what I saw last week because. Um, in 2019, we were up on the uh, Greenland ice cap over the town of Kangalusuak, which is where the main Greenland airport is. And we saw this um, nasty looking mess. And it was very warm that day. And it was the largest daily loss of ice by melting ever recorded, 12 and a half billion tonnes in one day. Now that was exceeded, I'm not quite sure by what, uh, on the same day of this year when I was up there again. And it looked exactly the same, except the ice was even darker. The ice is dark um, because it's when, when the ice origin, snow originally falls on the ice surface and makes, creates ice, um, there's a whole load of dirt, uh, dust and algae, all kinds of things fall on the ice sheet. And then when the ice sheet melts, the, the water goes away, but the dirt remains. And that's called black ice. And here, here we have a typical uh, landscape of black ice. And of course, black ice absorbs radiation much more efficiently than white ice. So if you have a glacier, as this, this one is, they called the, the Russell Glacier, which is um, part of the Greenland ice sheet, that is going to be melting faster than, than, than in the past because it's blacker than it used to be and absorbs more radiation. Next slide. Here's another view of, of a slope of the glacier and it, it looks like it's been painted over with brown paint and that's the muck and dirt. And what I was up there to, to look at last week was to, to sample and to study the composition of this stuff to see whether it's been joined by um, dirt from some sort resulting from the massive fires that we've had in across North America. So that's had an impact that may be very much more serious than you think. I mean, it's very serious when a, when a whole, whole huge area burns down and people lose their lives and their homes. But at the same time, that, that burning produces soot and the soot's deposited on the ice sheet and that causes the ice sheet to melt more rapidly. Next slide. And of course, not only does that happen on the Greenland ice sheet, but amazingly, it happens in Siberia now, and um, there's uh, unexpected because you think of Siberian tundra as being wet, mucky stuff that doesn't burn, 
but in fact not only does it burn but it stays lit through the winter um, it smolders through the winter and then the fire bursts out again in the summer so the russians estimate that the area of um, siberia covered with fires is greater than all of the area of the rest of the world covered by fires. So it's very, very serious. Next slide. And in a little small way, I saw one of these uh, fires while driving through Pasadena. You, you think of Pasadena as a city. And when I saw this fire, I thought, oh, well, it must be a, an office block caught fire. But in fact, it was a canyon full of brush, which had caught fire. So the the the, the brush fires in, in California actually creep right into the cities because uh, of the, uh, the fact that there are large areas of, of undeveloped land within city limits. Next slide. Well, um, Greenland uh, not only has it warmed up, uh, but it's really melting and the, the, the red shows how many days of melt we get now in Greenland and the one on the picture on the left looks at how much we used to get in the past which is not much at all. So Greenland's melting faster because of warmer temperatures and it's maybe warming faster because of this black ice effect. Next slide and that's this is and of course, when that melts quickly, uh, it, Greenland has become the major contributor towards global sea level rise. Next slide. Now, uh, I'm going to go quickly through these things here because I'm running out of time. Um, but uh, another big effect, well, there's two more effects I'll talk about. One is that um, one of the reasons why we see these extraordinary weather events occurring now, extreme heat and extreme cold, is that um, we have two main air masses in the northern hemisphere, the polar air mass over here, tropical air mass down here, and they used to be separated by a fairly straight line, which was the jet stream, a strong wind. Um, but now the polar air mass is warming much faster than the tropical air mass. The difference in temperature is going down and that means that the, the uh, wind is weakening. As the wind weakens it adopts this kind of um, set of lobes instead of a straight line and that those lobes allow warm air to get to high latitudes like here we see um, the prairies hot air is reaching up here and here we see cold air uh, from the Arctic coming down reaching the northeastern states of the US. So that's something that is going to get worse because the temperature difference between the Arctic and the uh, lower latitudes is decreasing and will continue to decrease and the result will be more and more of these weather anomalies are hot or cold. And next slide please. And so here we see what's what happens now to that, that the uh, um, as the cold air moves south to mix with the warm air, we see this, this um, straight line jet stream weakening and becoming this uh, uh, this wind which is now uh, in a very irregular shape. Next slide. And the effect of that is, is very serious because uh, it's, it's doing its thing, this battle of the boundary between the Arctic air and the tropical air is occurring in mid, mid latitudes of the north. And like, uh, and that means places like um, Canada, the US, Europe, the Ukraine, these are all places where most of our crops are grown. So we're disturbing crop production just in the places where we need food most. Next slide. And the result is that 
that food is getting more expensive. And this was a food price index um, produced by the UN, uh, where they started at 100 in 2000. And very rapidly, the, this is the average price of food throughout the world. And it's gone up from 100 to over 200 in just uh, one and a half decades. So when it reaches a peak, as it's done twice, that produces enormous distress for people living in cities in the third world, where food is a major item and they can't grow it themselves. So these place names are some of the places where there's been revolutions, uprisings, due to the cost of food. Uh, next slide. Also, as well as that, the general cost, uh, temperature of the planet rising uh, is reducing the yield of, of nearly all of the standard crops that we grow. Those are the maize, soybean, rice, wheat. Um, they, when you first start warming the planet, the yield actually goes up, but it soon changes to becoming a lower yield. So as well as the, the uh, change in the, um, the weather extremes, we are also getting a steady decrease in the yield of crops uh, because of just, even if, the weather, even if the weather were stable, it would be too warm. Next slide. Uh, I think I'll, I have to move on a bit here. So uh, next, next slide. Um, another, I keep going on about horrors, but um, one of them, another one is the fact that um, with all the extra CO2 going into the ocean, the ocean is becoming more acidic. And as the ocean gets to be more acidic, this starts to kill off some of the very vital creatures in the ocean, for foraminifera, which are tiny marine uh, creatures that have shells. And um, as you uh, make the ocean more acidic, the shells um, re-dissolve. They don't, they don't drop down to the seabed, which is what they used to do. And this used, foraminifera going to the seabed used to produce these vast fields of, of ooze on the sea ocean bed, which was a way that carbon was gotten rid of by the planet. That's not happening so much anymore because the, the foraminifera don't reach the seabed. They re-dissolve in the water. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Hello, Professor Wadhams. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt your presentation here, but um, we, I'm conscious of the, the time pressing on, and uh, I'm aware that your talk is entitled uh, Curbing the Ice Melt by Mining the Sky. I wondered if you could speak on uh, your solutions to the problems that you've outlined yes, well, over a couple of minutes. On, let's go on with that, because normally I work my own slides, so it's quicker. But uh, can, we, can we move on with slides um, until we get to keep, keep going? Uh, keep going, I'll miss out this methane uh, problem, which is, uh, these, are, these are methane plumes rising to the surface. Um, keep going, okay, here we are. Um, what, we, what we can do about, as I said at the beginning, is we have to try to remove carbon dioxide from, from the atmosphere, rather than simply emit less of it. Uh, next slide. Now remember that the amount of carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere is 42 gigatons a year. That's billion tons. So, and that mass has, to, if we're going to save the world, we've got to get rid of that amount every year. And then we can start to bring the, the uh, CO2 level of the atmosphere down. So we have two mega tasks. One is to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere all the time. But the second is to remove the legacy carbon dioxide, which is the, uh, what we put into the atmosphere over, over all the time since the in industrial revolution. 
Next slide. And how do we do it? Well, various, I won't go through all the means that have been suggested except to say that they're, none of them work except air capture. The reason is people have said, well, we can plant more trees. We, um, but if you look on the bottom left, you can see that just to remove the carbon dioxide produced by Europe would re require a forest the size of Europe. So the entire planet would have to be covered with trees, uh, which of course is not likely to happen given that we're, we're chopping down trees as fast as we can, at least uh, the, the Brazilian precedent is. So when you look at these uh, various methods that have been suggested, in the end, you're reduced to taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, next slide. And um, go straight on, go to the next one. And well, I will talk about the bleeding Amazon because <laughs> it's, it's a bleeding disgrace. Um, but next slide, please. Uh, we know that most of the carbon dioxide in, in the, on the planet is actually in the ocean and in sedimentary rocks. Um, next slide, please. So the Paris Agreement is, is I feel, I fear, somewhat bogus because all the 195 nations in the world agreed to bring down uh, the rate of warming to a low level, um, but they were going to do this purely by reducing emissions. And you can't because if you reduce emissions, you're still adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make any logical sense to, to, to say we can get the atmosphere back into a, a good state by simply reducing our emissions. We have to take CO2 out of the atmosphere as well. And next slide. So if you just cut emissions, CO2 will continue to increase. So we have to remove it, that's the green. And uh, next slide. Um, the, the methods that have been proposed, and there's many of them, but um, the, the key one is, is CO2 removal. There, there are methods that, that um, involve increasing the amount of radiation reflected from the planet. Uh, next slide. And that's um, a method that's been developed by Stephen Salter at Edinburgh University, which consists of, of um, firing um, tiny droplets of seawater up through these masts into the lower parts of marine clouds. And the, it makes the clouds brighter. So you know, they reflect more radiation and we get a cooling. It's, it's a method that would work, um, but it doesn't do anything about the CO2 level. It doesn't get rid of the CO2 that's causing acidification and, and you have to keep applying it. Uh, but it's still the best, I think it's the most promising method to be developed in Britain and it's, it's scandalous and it's not being applied properly despite the fact that Britain is hosting the COP26 meeting and that Salter himself comes from Edinburgh University. Next slide. Um, I missed that one out. Go on to the next one. Um, so the, the direct air capture is the one that, that I favour. Um, another method um, is called biochar and uh, I'm afraid there's not going to be time to talk about that. Next slide. Um, well, there is a minute. Um, the biochar involves taking agricultural waste and cooking it in a, in a biomethod called pyrolysis, which doesn't actually burn it, but produces a kind of charcoal. Um, and this takes away a lot of the carbon dioxide. Next slide. And uh, that's, that's the, the cooker. And next slide. One of the nice things is there's a university in California, Ventura, where the, the university power plant works off biochar production. So it's the only university known that has uh, its energy source as, you, as pistachio nut shells. 
Uh, next slide. Anyway, let's go to direct air capture. What it consists of is passing blowing air over through uh, a fan by fan through a substance which which removes the CO2. There's lots of those around, just sodium hydroxide will do it. So there's a capture solution. You then have to do various things to that capture solution to take the CO2 out of that capture solution and take therefore the parent solution back into, to, to back to have uh, air passed over it again. So this is one, one of the side part cycles used. Uh, next slide. And the, the big companies, or oh, they're, they're not big, but they're trying to get big. The companies involved in this are Carbon Engineering in Squamish, BC, which uses uh, hydropower. That's why they set themselves up in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, next slide. And what they do is, is an extra side process to the carbon dioxide to turn it into fuel. Now you sort of might think, well, that's a bit stupid. You're getting rid of carbon dioxide, then you're burning it again. But what the fuel they're thinking of is air fuel, gas, is um, jet aviation fuel. And it's, it's not feasible to make um, electric powered aircraft yet. So if you're going to make aircraft powered by fossil fuel, you may as well use fossil fuel that you've already taken out of the atmosphere. Uh, next slide. These are some pictures of the, their process in action. Uh, next slide. I'm sorry I'm having to rush here. I, uh, <laughs> I, I miscalculated because I was busy kind of uh, falling over and breaking a rib. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> next slide. Okay, the other company that does a wonderfully important job is called Blue Planet. And this shows part of their process, which is producing nodules of limestone. So their, their method takes CO2 out of the, out of the atmosphere, produces uh, artificial limestone, and that limestone is a, thunk, a product that the world needs. In musing over what do we do, how do, what do we do with the 42 gigabyte, gigatons of, of CO2 that we've got rid of? You have to turn it into a useful product. And the most useful product is rock, sand, and building material. And so um, Blue Planet have, have concentrated on that, and especially on concentrating on making artificial limestone rock. Next slide. And here's some of the nodules. I normally bring some with me, but uh, since <laughs> we're doing this remotely, you can't see them, but they're there. Uh, next slide. And you can see that that's, that's just passing the gas through the scrubber. Uh, next slide. And this is um, one of the things that they do, which I think is wonderful. They, they take these nodules and put them inside concrete so that you get a concrete aggregate, which is actually carbon neutral or carbon negative, as opposed to Chinese concrete, which is terrible for, for um, climate, this, this carbon negative concrete actually uh, takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Next slide. And they've, their first big venture, which was very successful, was to re-roof one of the terminals at San Francisco airport. And here they are with this ne carbon negative concrete. So the brilliant ideas in, in, an, in the air being done but what we need is enough seriousness of purpose and enough money to be put into it all to enable this to be the main way of trying to bring the climate back, to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, rather than simply uh, reduce the amount of new CO2 we add, which is our present strategy, which I think is quite wrong. Okay, um, I'm having to stop there because I, <laughs> I ran about and ran ran too far over, but you, you, you see the point of what I'm trying to get at and why I think we need to do it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wadhams. There were so many 
fascinating ideas in there um, with just so much material to cover. And we had also loads of um, really um, insightful questions on YouTube as well. But I think, unfortunately, we will not have time to explore those because we are running into the next event, I'm afraid. Um, so just I'd like to say thank you to Professor Wadhams and our audience at home. Um, I'd also like to thank our tech team and uh, inform you that the next event is at 9 p.m. and is look, looking at the road tunnels running under the seabed that connect to the, the various Faroe Islands and is presented by the chief executive of the company that owns the latest tunnel. Um, all this year's Science Festival events are free but if you want to support the festival, you can donate and instructions on how to do this are available on our website, which is oisf.org. Please do subscribe to the Orkney International Science Festival YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. Uh, remember that you can join us at the Festival Club this evening, which starts at 9.30 p.m. Um, and you'll find a link to that in the description where you'll be able to meet some of the day's speakers in an informal event. Um, uh, Professor Wadhams, I don't know if you'll be joining that. Um, um, yes, I hope to. I'm, I'm nursing a couple of broken ribs at the moment. Well, I, I did think that, <laughs> so, so you, you may need to, <laughs> to, to rest. I, I don't know. I'll see if I can manage it. <laughs> but, but thank you very much. Um, there are also some evaluation forms, I think, which are available on the website. Um, so thanks again, um, good evening and goodbye.